There the bend it was cut deep through a crag of old weathered stone, once long ago vomited from the mountain's furnaces. Panting under his load, Sam turned the bend, and even as he did so, out of the corner of his eye, he had a glimpse of something falling from the crag, like a small piece of black stone that had toppled off as he passed. A sudden weight smote him, and he crashed forward, tearing the backs of his hands as still clasped his master's. Then he knew what had happened. For above him as he lay, he heard a hated voice. Wicked master, it hissed. Wicked master. Jesus, Jesus, Kitsus, Kitsmeagol. Oh. He mustn't go that way. He mustn't hurt precious. Give it to Smeagol, yes. Give it to us. Give it to us. With a violent heave, Sam rose up. At once he drew his sword, but he could do nothing. Gollum and Frodo were locked together. Gollum was tearing at his master, trying to get at the chain and the ring. This was probably the only thing that could have roused the dying embers of Frodo's heart and will, an attack, an attempt to wrest his treasure from him by force. He fought back with a sudden fury that amazed Sam and Gollum also. Even so, things might have gone far otherwise if Gollum himself had remained unchanged. But whatever dreadful path, lonely and hungry and waterless, he had trodden, driven by a devouring desire and a terrible fear, they had left grievous marks on him. He was a lean, starved, haggard thing, all bones and tight-drawn, sallow skin. A wild light flamed in his eyes, but his malice was no longer matched by his old griping strength. Frodo flung him off and rose up, quivering. Down, down, he gasped, touching to his hand to his breast so that beneath the cover of his leather shirt he clasped the ring. Down, you creeping thing, and out of my path. Your time is at an end. You cannot betray me or slay me now. Then suddenly, as before under the eaves of the Emin Muir, Sam saw these two rivals with other vision, a crouching shape, scarcely more than the shadow of a living thing, a creature now wholly ruined and defeated, yet filled with a hideous lust and rage. Before it stood stern, untouchable now by pity, a figure robed in white, but at its breast it held a wheel of fire. Out of the fire there spoke a commanding voice. Be gone, and trouble me no more. If you touch me ever again, you shall be cast yourself into the fire of doom. A crouching shape backed away, terror in his blinking eyes, and yet at the same time insatiable desire. Then the vision passed, and Sam saw Frodo standing, hand on his breast, his breath coming in great gasps, and Gollum at his feet, resting on his knees, with his wide splayed hands upon the ground. Look out, cried Sam, you spring. He stepped forward, brandishing his sword. Quick, master, he gasped. Go on, go on, no time to lose. I'll deal with him. Go on. Frodo looked at him as if at one now far away. Yes, I must go on, he said. Farewell, Sam. This is the end at last. On Mount Doom, Doom shall fall. Farewell. He turned and went on, walking slowly but erect up the climbing path. Now, said Sam, at last I can deal with you. He leapt forward with drawn blade ready for battle. The golem did not spring. He fell flat upon the ground and whimpered. Don't kill us, he wept. Don't hurt us with nasty, cruel steel. Let us live, yes. Live just a little longer. Lost, lost, we're lost. And when precious goes, we'll die, yes. Die into the dust. He tore up the ashes of his path, his long flesh, his fingers, dusty hissed. Sam's hand wavered. His mind was hot with wrath and the memory of evil. It would be just to slay this treacherous, murderous creature, just and many times deserved. Also, it seemed the only safe thing to do. But deep in his heart there was something that restrained him. He could not strike this thing lying in the dust, forlorn, ruinous, utterly wretched. He himself, though only for a little while, had borne the ring. Now dimly he guessed the agony of Gollum's shriveled mind and body, enslaved to that ring, unable to find peace or relief ever in life again. 
But Sam had no words to express what he felt. Oh, curse you, you stinking thing, he said. Go away, be off. I don't trust you. Not as far as I could kick you, but be off, or I shall hurt you. Yes, with nasty, cruel steel. Gollum got up on all fours and backed away for several paces. And then he turned, and as Sam aimed to kick at him, he fled away down the path. Sam gave no more heed to him. He suddenly remembered his master. He looked up the path and could not see him. As fast as he could, he trudged up the road. If he had looked back, he might have seen not far below Gollum turn again, and then with a the wild light of madness glaring in his eyes come swiftly but warily, creeping on behind, a slinking shadow among the stones. The path climbed on. Soon it bent again, and with a last eastward course, passed in a cutting along the face of the cone, and came to the dark door in the mountainside, the door of the Sammath Naur. Far away now, rising towards the south, the sun, piercing the smokes and haze, burned ominous, a dull, bleared disk of red. And all Mordor lay about the mountain like a dead land, silent, shadow-folded, waiting for some dreadful stroke. Sam came to the gaping mouth and peered in. It was dark and hot. A deep rumbling shook the air. Frodo, master, he called. There was no answer. For a moment he stood, his heart beating with wild fears, and then he plunged in. A shadow followed him. At first he could see nothing. In his great need he drew out once more the phial of Galadriel, but it was pale and cold in his trembling hand, and threw no light into that stifling dark. He was come to the heart of the realm of Sauron, and the forces of his ancient might, greatest in Middle-earth. All other powers were here subdued.